Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Again, my name is Kurt Thomas. I'm a research scientist at Google. And today, I want to talk about a joint project we've been doing with New York University and the International Computer Science Institute on understanding the marketplace of purchasing installs on a user's machine. So for over two years now, uh, we've been seeing millions of users uh, exhibiting symptoms of unwanted software. These are things like ad injectors that inject new content onto YouTube, uh, PC cleanup utilities that purport to identify thousands of errors on a user's machine and offer a subscription fee to clean it up, and browser settings hijackers that modify the default search engine and replace it to sell that traffic. We received over like 100,000 user complaints related to these types of symptoms. So we know it's a nuisance to users, but we didn't really understand how that software was actually getting onto the victim's machine in the first place. So we started to look into this marketplace known as commercial paper install. And it's this practice of when you go and download a piece of software that will bundle several additional offers at install time. So if you go to download.com or any other popular download portal, it's very often you'll see one of these dialogues like those shown above. Um, and while bundling in and of it itself isn't uh, an abusive practice, very often these consent dialogues are buried within like walls of text or fail to accurately disclose the type of software that's going to be installed on the user's machine. Even worse, uh, users often encounter these bundles through deceptive promotional practices. So if you go to a video site and you see your video codec is out of date or you need to install some video player, it's very likely that that's going to lead to a bundle that installs unwanted software. Likewise, if you go to a very popular torrent site and the most prominent button is download button, that's likely an advertisement that leads to unwanted software, not actually the torrent tracker. So what I want to talk about today is kind of our year-long investigation into this marketplace of bundling and what's going on. And the particular questions we wanted to answer are, what is the relationship between the people who are behind this uh, commercial bundling and unwanted software developers? And also, what are the deceptive promotional tools that are being used within this ecosystem to trick or coerce users into actually consenting to these terms of service? And ultimately understand the negative impact that it has on users. Uh, because at the end of this talk, what I hope to get across with you is how huge a problem this is for users, and hopefully that the rest of the community gets on board as tackling unwanted software as as prominent a problem as, say, drive-by downloads or social engineering. So to get started, I want to give just a little bit of a behind-the-scenes perspective of what goes on when you uh, launch one of those commercial bundles. So it turns out that commercial PPI is operated like an affiliate market. Um, so what you start with is a set of advertisers who are software developers willing to purchase installs. They don't really have a distribution mechanism of their own. You don't really have a strong incentive to get users to install an ad injector. So instead, what they go to is these middlemen, these paper install, basically, networks. Uh, they're very similar to advertising networks in this regard. And they basically say, I will pay you in order to distribute my software. But it turns out this, these PPI networks, these middlemen, don't actually have any distribution arm of their own. They, in turn, reach out to affiliate publishers, people who have popular software or popular websites or advertisements, uh, where they already have user traffic coming to them, and they can convert those installs or those website visits uh, into money. And so they say, hey, publisher, if you just bundle these several additional applications with your install process, we'll pay you out for each successful install. And in return, the PPI network keeps a little bit of a cut, and the advertiser is basically paying for all of this. So publishers who participate in this market, what the PPI network itself gives to them is basically a bundle generator. So if you have a popular application, or maybe you just want to redistribute Chrome inside a bundle, they basically provide an upload functionality. You go to their website, you say, submit an EXE, uh, maybe give a thank you page, and they automatically rewrap it in this technology that will add advertisement offers to it. And the control for the publisher is actually fairly limited. You get to select maybe that there's going to be one offer or maybe five offers. But what actually gets bundled with your software is up to the PPI network and basically ad optimization. So what this leads to is this very decentralized distribution environment that is somewhat ripe for abuse. So if you have well-behaving publishers, even people who are legitimately wanting to part excuse me, participate in this network, um, they have no knowledge of which advertisers they're going to be distributing. It could be ad injectors or it could be something benign. Likewise, if you have legitimate advertisers who are just trying to like, have real terms of, condition, or terms of service, uh, it could be you know, publishers are actually distributing their software through video codec trickery or things like that. 
And so it's very hard for any one person in this market to kind of police abuse. And likewise, if any single one participant in this entire chain acts abusively, that leads to an unwanted software download where there wasn't proper user consent. So for our project, what we wanted to do is actually get an inside perspective of how these markets were operating and who were the participants inside of that. And so we built out a lot of infrastructure to actually track what was going on inside the ecosystem. So to start, we had to figure out who are the PPI marketplaces that are out there? Like, who are these like, anomalous entities? Um, and it turns out you can actually get a lot of conversations about paper install on underground forums. And the reason for that is that anybody can sign up as a publisher. So you can have both benign entities and hostile entities that are participating in this marketplace. And so you'll find lots of conversations about deceptive tactics, as well as who offers the best conversion rate, who actually pays for installs on time, and all sorts of things like that. So based on looking at underground forums, we were able to identify about 50 different PPI networks that were in operation. And based on some telemetry from Safe Browsing about which ones were having the most impact on users at that time, we selected four to study in depth. Uh, Outbrowse, Open Candy, A Monetize, and Install Monetizer. Uh, some of these are located in the US, uh, Israel, and um, many of the others are located in Russia. But the important thing to note is these are real commercial businesses. Uh, often they're publicly traded or they're startups. Um, so they have real money behind them. They operate out in the clear. The other interesting thing about all of these different PPI networks is that they often advertise all of their pricing information to try to attack, attract affiliates to join the marketplace. So you know the price for an install for one market may be 91 cents, and another it's two dollars, and another maybe it's 70 cents. So what we did is actually on a regular basis we'd go and crawl all of the pricing data that was available within this market, so we could actually track trends about how much it costs to get an install in the United States or other countries. To actually see who's buying these installs is a little more complicated. Uh, what we ended up doing is acquiring samples for each of the four PPI networks we were interested in. Um, and we basically launched them in a sandbox environment and kind of observe what happens uh, when the bundle launches. And it turns out that you know, this express install option where you get five to 10 other options uh, for bundling uh, is dynamic. So at the time of launch, they reach out to a command and control server. Uh, and the first thing they do is provide a fingerprint that says, I'm launching on this new system. Uh, these are its characteristics. Who wants to be installed on this device in this particular region? And the CNC will respond back with a bunch of different potential offers. Uh, they'll display it to the user. And then the user may or may not consent to actually having those installed. Uh, and once that's done, they report back successful installs and then may show like an optional uh, thank you screen at the very end, which is usually you successfully installed these applications. If you're interested in even more software, please visit this website. So more advertisements, more software to download. That fingerprint that gets sent back to that command and control server usually consists of about six things. An IP address for geolocation purposes, the browser, the operating system, and whether or not administrative uh, permissions are available. Because that dictates the level of control that whatever software gets bundled uh, will have when it's installed on the system. And they also include things like the MAC address and machine ID of the system um, to basically combat fraud. So they don't want people who are participating in this marketplace to say, oh, I've installed 100 different uh, uh, bundles on this one machine. So they're also trying to combat abuse from publishers and advertisers in the network. So what we ended up doing is having understood this protocol is to build milkers that simulate just the first stage. We're not interested in saying that we've like recuperating in cost or incurring any fees to advertisers. So we just say, we have a fresh machine. It has Chrome, it has Internet Explorer, and it's running Windows 7. What are the offers you have available for this particular machine? And what you get back is usually this encrypted or obfuscated blob. So we had to write some modules to basically uh, de-obfuscate that. And what pops out is usually a JSON set of instructions that consists of an executable URL. So this is the URL you're supposed to go fetch uh, as a part of the offer screen. It also includes a lot of do not install criteria. So they can specify registry keys. And I'll get into why they do this a little bit later. But one of the options is you don't want to install on a system you already have paid for an install on. So it's preventing doubles. But there's some abuse that can happen there too. Uh, and then they include things like, what are the command line parameters that are going to be run, which is somewhat revealing, like modify the default search. Um, and they also do things like sleep after install, which specifies 
uh, don't show any of the symptoms related to having installed this application for a long time. So that users who have basically consented to the bundle um, don't understand necessarily that one week later when all of a sudden ads start popping up all over the page, what was the reason that led to that? So we ran um, these particular milkers uh, for the, the offers to be able to automatically identify uh, what was being pushed through the network. And we automatically scraped the prices uh, basically every day for the course of a year. And for the particular binaries that we pulled down from the, uh, the PPI networks, we put them into a binary analysis environment, looked at like, what file system changes happened, what processes were launched, and different things like that. Uh, we also submitted them to VirusTotal to see whether or not any AV uh, members of the industry thought that this was unwanted software or even maybe outright malware. And the last thing we did is some rudimentary family clustering. Because if you have multiple versions of the same advertiser software, or that same advertiser works across multiple different PPI networks, we want to all collapse it down into one particular family. So more details on this in the paper if you actually want to go see that. So what comes out of all of this uh, data collection phase is that from January of last year to January of this year, we collected over 450,000 offers that would have been bundled uh, with users who were basically launching one of these applications. And of those, about 1,200 were unique. And some networks are larger than others. You know, Open Candy, we only got about 77,000. And Amonetize was one of the largest. We had about 230,000 different uh, potential offers there. So with this data set, the question we wanted to answer is, who out there is actually paying for installs? Are they abusive entities, or is this a legitimate marketplace that you know, we're uh, inappropriately disparaging, potentially? Um, so the first thing we looked at is the number of distinct advertisers that are participating across each of these individual PPI networks. Um, overall, every week we see about 150, 160 different software families participating in this marketplace. <coughs> Uh, for Open Candy, it's anywhere from about you know, 15 to 25 different software uh, vendors basically paying for installs. And for OutBrowse, it's anywhere from 75 to about 100 different people. But if we look at who in particular is distributing every single day, um, it story tells itself. It's basically ad injectors, browsing settings hijackers, and uh, PC cleanup utilities. So any day of the year when you launch one of the PPI bundles that these people are distributing through publishers, um, all four networks are distributing Wajam, which is an ad injector. Uh, all four distribute BrowserFox, and all four distribute um, what some AV industry um, players consider basically scareware, where you say, here's a bunch of issues with your machine, 30 to $40, I'll fix those for you. Um, and they're all just bundled within this uh, same package that gets launched. We also see um, some potentially legitimate players uh, participating in this marketplace as well. So uh, in terms of antivirus, we see AVG Toolbar, Lavasoft, Commodo, and Kiho all basically buying installs on two users' machines. One thing to note is all of these uh, AV industry players um, have their own affiliate programs. So you can say, go to AVG and say, I'll distribute your software for you. And for, uh, for successful subscriptions, they will pay you back. So you can have basically third parties distributing AVG for, on AVG's behalf. So it's unclear whether the antivirus industry is actually participating in this market, or third parties that they reach out to are doing it on their behalf. We also see some brand name software like Opera, Skype, Yahoo, and AOL. Again, a lot of these also run affiliate programs, so it becomes very murky whether or not it's the brand name itself that's buying installs or somebody else. So these are just the top active entities within the market. What about the other you know, 800 software families that we saw? So to kind of investigate whether or not they were unwanted, what we did is we looked at the virus total labels for those particular software families. Um, and so every week, we flagged what fraction of offers being distributed through this marketplace uh, were unwanted. Uh, and it's about 59%. So on the low end, open candy, anywhere from 0 to 25% of everything that was being bundled is being flagged by somebody out there as being likely unwanted. Whereas for uh, install monetizers, anywhere from 75% to 100%. So for many of these marketplaces, the core contributors, people who are actually buying installs all of the time, are all unwanted software developers. And as a consequence to basically some AV uh, members flagging these types of binaries, they've gone on the defensive. So I mentioned at the very beginning that you can specify a list of registry keys that you don't want to be installed alongside. 
And so what they end up using that for is to list all of the registry keys of hostile antivirus. So Avast, ESET, um, and other different members of the community, um, they basically say, if you're going to remove my software, don't install me on this machine. Choose some other likely unwanted software uh, bundle or uh, advertiser that isn't going to be flagged. And likewise, they also flag things like OpenVPN and VMware and VirtualBox to identify basically hostile environments that they might be being installed in and being uh, introspected on. And about 20% of the advertisers in the marketplace were using this type of technique. Overall, in terms of pricing, it's actually remained relatively stable throughout time. You know, in the United States, it's about $1.50 across all of these different marketplaces to buy and install. Um, in Great Britain, it's about 80 cents. And in other regions of the world, like China, Russia, South America, and Africa, it's as low as about 10 cents. Um, one thing to note is that these prices are about 10x the price you can get on the black market for installs. And that's because there is a consent dialogue. There is this veil of user consent going on. And therefore, it's really hard to basically say that this uh, download shouldn't have happened. And as a consequence, you have to pay more for this. So given all of our understanding about how this marketplace was operating, we wanted to understand what impact was this having on users as a whole. Um, and the way we did this is we started collecting all of the binaries and identifying them. Uh, I think we had about 1.5 million in total that we knew were publishers belonging to this PPI ecosystem. So people who had wrapped their software and we're starting to distribute offers. And when we detect that, uh, if we know it's a website that's doing it, we'll show a, a browser level interstitial that says the site ahead may contain harmful programs. And likewise, if um, we know the individual download, so the executable that a person is grabbing uh, is potentially unwanted, we'll show uh, a warning on that particular download. So in terms of how many warnings we show, um, every, every week over the course of our study, we were showing about 60 million user warnings related to unwanted software downloads. And the gesticulation that you see is the consequence of many of these participants trying to actively evade Google's detection. So when you see it go down and up again, it's basically an arms race that's going on between detection and some of the members of this uh, community. We compare that to other threats that safe browsing tries to tackle, uh, particularly malware, we see that unwanted software is three times more likely to affect users than, say, drive-by downloads or um, social engineering style attacks. And so it's really critical to understand that there are millions of users out there that are encountering this type of practice every day, but we as a community have mostly focused only on the malware aspect of it. And there are also a lot of uh, individuals who um, either don't abide by this warning, or we don't show a warning, or had existing installs on their system. And so to help them, we provide this Chrome cleanup tool. It's basically uh, when we detect unwanted symptoms on a user's machine, we recommend they run this particular tool, and we'll help them clean up unwanted software. And via this tool, we've detected tens of millions of unwanted software installs. So not just download attempts, but actual uh, infections on a user's machine. And if we look at who are the top families that we're detecting with this tool, and it's by no means comprehensive, so this is kind of um, who are the top players in this marketplace, uh, all of the top 10 are using PPI as a distribution platform. So there's a really strong relationship between uh, the unwanted software that we're seeing ending up on user systems and this paper install marketplace. So the last thing I want to talk about today is a little bit on the, the deceptive techniques that some of these parties are using to actually get users to consent to installing. Um, one of the most interesting is that some of the paper install networks themselves actually tell their publishers, this is how you can get installs on a person's machine. And they'll provide you uh, basically media content like here's a Java update, here's a Java error, or here's a uTorrent client. And they basically provide these as drop-in JavaScript blobs that you can host on your website. And any successful installs, you get money, and the PPI network gets money. So there are PPI networks out there that are actually complicit in understanding that they should deceive users. We also see, like I said, as a consequence of basically um, safe browsing and other people flagging websites that are using this uh, deceptive distribution practices, uh, resorting to techniques like domain cycling. So this is a screenshot of a particular forum where they're basically saying, you know, all of our domains got blocked a couple of days ago. Make sure to update everything that you're sourcing from. Now, let's share us.com is let's share.club. 
Um, and they do this now every one to seven hours for most of the PPI networks. So they know they're being blocked, and rather than trying to clean up what's going on inside the ecosystem, they instead turn to evasive tactics. And the last thing they do is try to prevent safe browsing from uh, scanning the binaries that users are downloading in the first place. Um, so this is one technique that was advertised on a website. So when a user clicked on a download, it basically provided you step-by-step -step instructions on how to infect yourself. Uh, step one, install this RAR. Uh, step two, provide the password to decrypt it. Um, and then as a last step, basically consent to the dialog. Uh, this is a defunct technique now, but at uh, the time it was launched, it basically prevented safe browsing from scanning the binary and alerting the user that this was a likely unwanted software install. So um, wrapping up, and I'm a little bit quick, um, the takeaways that I hope that I can get across today is that unwanted software is this massive commercial ecosystem that's out there. It's affecting tens of millions of users, and pay per install, this model of basically bundling software on download portals, on torrent sites, um, and through advertisements, is the primary distribution vector for a lot of this software. And while there's nothing necessarily wrong with bundling in and of itself, Right now, the way the industry is organized is there is a misaligned incentive between advertisers and publishers. Publishers have to focus solely on conversion rates, and advertisers have to focus on how am I going to recuperate that lost fee, that $1.50 I pay for an install in the United States? And the answer is right now, ad injection, browser settings hijacking, and basically subscription fees. And so it really takes the cooperation across the industry and for players within this market to try to clean up what's going on. And so as part of this, um, Google's been working with the Clean Software Alliance, uh, which is a collection of some of these different PPI networks and some of the advertisers on trying to come up with ways to actually provide uh, meaningful value propositions to users. That if you want to bundle software, here's how to do it properly. And if you don't, then the antivirus industry and the browser industry and other platforms uh, should prevent you from uh, negatively impacting users. So what I hope is that the rest of the research community today also gets on board in trying to tackle this problem. And with that, uh, thanks everybody for your time. Any questions? I just uh, have a quick question. I noticed that you had a graph with all the warnings that uh, Chrome was showing to people. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering why all of a sudden you have like a big drop on all the warnings, especially in the month of November, I believe, because you had a graph and then all of a sudden it's just like dropping dramatically. Yeah. Do uh, you know why those uh, events are happening? So we don't have like concrete um, attribution of what's going on, but our hypothesis basically because this is turning to a little bit of an arms race, where we deploy defenses like um, blacklist, well, not blacklisting, warning on domains, as well as warning on binaries. Like I said, they have that domain cycling technique. It may be that basically they come up with a technique for that short window, uh, which we don't have a defense for. And so they kind of fall off our radar, and then we fix it, and then we start warning users again. So you see this kind of uh, trough behavior. Thank you. Hi, William Coulter. Uh, I'm interested in whether any of your research has influenced the usability uh, teams at Google. Because, uh, you know, like you can go to google.com and it says install this toolbar. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of similar to some of the behavior you see on these kinds of things or other kinds of things. So I'm interested in how your research might be able to improve the design of user interfaces. Yeah, we're super cognizant of basically trying to improve across the board how you present software install dialogues to users. I would call out the major difference between, say, you know, Java bundling ass toolbar is that there's a direct relationship between the advertiser and the publisher there. And both have an incentive that the user has uh, a good user experience. Whereas in this market, because of the ambiguity about what software you're even going to be bundled alongside, like you can be an antivirus toolbar and bundled alongside an ad injector in this particular case. Um, there's a lot of uh, less, I don't know, direct relationships, and as a consequence, it's really murky as to what's going on. So, so you, you're suggesting basically because uh, PPIs obscure that relationship, they're going to come up with some way of you know, bypassing or making it look like normal software anyway, you know, that it's a lost cause? Um, wouldn't say it's a lost cause, because we are trying to basically work with that industry as well to come up with better installed dialogues. But at the current iteration that we're at right now, 
Um, there's really no incentive for advertisers to like, behave very properly because they can get installed no matter what uh, publishers want. There's no way to respect the publisher's wishes, whereas with direct distribution agreements, uh, you can basically go and say, I don't abide by the practices that you're doing. Thanks. Hello, uh, Jose Fernandez with Polytechnique Montréal. Um, how, how much coverage do you think you got in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the ecosystem of um, uh, the, um, the number of PPIs, essentially, the paper pre-installed uh, networks? Mm -hmm. um, and and it also, you, you, in terms of the, the samples, how, how confident you are that you got a, a good uh, qualitative coverage of, of the whole ecosystem? Yeah, that's a great question. So we did a deep dive in four particular networks because we knew, um, based on some telemetry data, they were some of the largest. Uh, we don't make any claim with the research that it's totally comprehensive of all PPI marketplaces that are out there. And I'd recommend you actually come to the next talk uh, where they do some other investigation in this particular area. Because um, you know, our approach was very deep, and the next talk is going to go very wide with all the different PPI networks, but less attribution possible there. Uh, okay, so while our next speaker sets up, I have a, another quick I question. I have one last question, actually. Uh, this oh, is Dan, sorry. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is Danny Huang from UC San Diego. I just have a little question about the uh, price of uh, PPI. So I noticed that um, the, the price uh, for PPI has been flat for most countries, except a few jumps. And given that this is an arms race and Google has been you know, tackling this problem, would one you know, be expecting that the price would fluctuate given what Google is trying to you know, suppress some of the unwanted software? Right. Um, so on the one hand, you would think the price should go up because basically installs are becoming harder and harder to come by. Um, I think the answer is complicated. Uh, I don't have the, the precise answer that you want. Um, we have seen networks basically shutting down as a consequence of the actions that are going on within the community as a whole, not just that Google is doing. Um, so some PPI networks are basically feeling the pressure of, you know, we can't just distribute unwanted software, we're being blocked, this is no longer a profitable industry. Um, so why the price graph remains flat, uh, I can't actually answer, but we are having a positive impact as a whole, I would say, still. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right, yeah. Uh, just one, one, one last quick question. If, uh, well, <laughs> I, w I was just wondering, so have you ever seen some, uh, like, uh, nasty malware like getting delivered through these PPI networks, like say some ransomware or whatever? Yeah, so there was an article I think about a year ago about one PPI network in particular that was distributing malware. Mm -hmm. I think the reason you don't see a lot more of it is that within the black market PPI networks, uh, installs are like 10x cheaper. Mm -hmm. So why bother with consent dialogues when you can just get installs and use this machine? Um, you know, unless the price were to drop dramatically, I don't foresee a lot of malware authors participating. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, let's thank our speaker again.